Welcome everybody to this lecture where I would like to talk about speculation and bank runs. We will have a look at the two most important models which explain a banking crisis and a bank run. It's a diamond dipfig model as well as a Milgram and Roberts model. Let's start with a short introduction. In this advertisement, it's, it is said, Geld anlegen darf kein Glücksspiel sein, which implies investing should not be a gamble. It's from the Herstatt Bank, like a private German bank. In another advertisement of the same bank, it is said, Mein Papi ist weitsichtiger, which implies my dad is not short-sighted, he's a Herstatt customer. The Herstatt Bank is a privately owned bank, a German bank in the city of Cologne. It went bankrupt in 1974 because of uh, some speculations in the foreign exchange market, market. and due to this bankruptcy, uh, the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision was created and uh, the objective of this uh, committee is that central banks and regulatory authorities should find some ways to avoid such kind of risk in the future. So this uh, bankruptcy of this bank was very important. Perhaps we gained the intuition that banking is pretty stable in Europe now. That kind of banking crisis occurred in the 1970s. And then there were some banking crises in developing countries. Yes, in Argentina, for example, when the currency board broke down. There was a banking crisis in Argentina, but we thought that this kind of stuff would not happen in Europe anymore. But then we saw pictures like that. When you look at these uh, letters here, it seems to be the case that uh, this is uh, a bank in Greece where some people line up in front of the bank and a banking crisis occurs. It is also the case that we saw some pictures recently that some people lined up in front of the UK bank Northern Rock. They, those people tried to get the money out of the bank. In a banking crisis, it is very likely that some people suffer. It might be the case that in the end, some private customer, they end up in a very desperate situation where they lose some of the money. And uh, in this lecture, I would like to explain the occurrence of bank runs with two models. And we'll also look at the policy implication, whether it's a good idea to have like a lender of the last resort in place whether to have a bank regulation in place, whether this makes sense or not. But let's start with a short introduction. What is the main role of the commercial banking sector? One main role of the commercial banking sector is to transform short-term deposits in long-term loans. Loans have a relatively low degree of liquidity, while deposits can be withdrawn at any time. If a bank accumulates deposits which have an independent risk with respect to the time of withdrawal, the business can be run with relatively low liquidity reserves. Why is that? Because most of the time it is a case that money is transferred within the banking sector. So when one private customer has to pay a bill to a company, it might be the case that this company has the account within the same bank so that when the private person transfers the money to the company this liquidity does not uh, leave the bank or at least it does not leave the banking sector in this case a bank and a banking sector can be run with relatively low liquidity reserves However, if the expectations of depositors with respect to the liquidity or profitability status of a bank worsen, 
The risk of a withdrawal from individual persons is not independent anymore. In this scenario, the risk will be positively correlated, that liquidity will leave the bank or the banking sector, and uh, then a bank run might occur. Let's start with some definitions. For example, I would like to define the term informational asymmetries. Informational asymmetries exist in case that one party has private information which another party also involved in this business has no access to. The informed agent may not have an incentive to release the private information to the other party because the informed agent can make a profit on their private information. If some activities cannot be observed after a contract has been signed, it might be the case that one party behaves in a way which is not in line with the contract. Let's have a look at the relationship between the bank and the debitor. A bank does not have full information with respect to the credit worthiness of a customer. So there is an informational, informational asymmetry because we assume that the debitor is able to evaluate its own credit worthiness. So we assume that the customer knows whether he wants to pay back or whether he wants to fool the bank. We assume that the bank is not able to distinguish between good and bad debitors because the credit worthiness is a private information of the debitor. A risk premium which influences interest rate is only adequate for the average customer. But as a consequence, it would be the case that the interest rate would be too high for customers with a good solvency and it would be too low for a customer with a low solvency. Customers with a good solvency have to pay the risk premium of an average customer, which is not adequate. The loan is too expensive and the good customer will disappear from the market. The customer with an above solvency will disappear from the market so that the average credit worthiness is reduced. A process which is called adverse selection will take place. Let's have a numerical example to highlight what I was talking about in this slide. Let's assume that in period one there exists a pool of potential customers. The customers are heterogeneous. So we have two groups of customers. We have 50% good customers. They deserve a low interest rate of five. And we have 50% bad customers and they deserve a high interest rate of 10. We assume that the bank uh, cannot screen the market. The bank, the bank cannot distinguish good and bad customers. A potential solution could be that the bank computes a weighted average interest rate. A weighted average interest rate, 50% good customers, they deserve an interest rate of 5% and 50% of the market are bad customers they deserve an interest rate of 10. So the weighted average interest rate is equal to 7.5%, which implies that the good customers would have to pay a risk premium of 2.5%. The bank will offer consumer credits at the interest rate of 7.5%, and the good customers have to pay a risk premium of 2.5%, despite the fact that they are good customers. What will happen over time? In period two, it will be the case that the pool of potential customers will change, like the good customers leave the market. The good customers know that they deserve an interest rate of five, but they have to pay the risk premium of 2.5 and they get an offer of, for the credit of 7.5. The interest rate is too high and the good customers will disappear. They don't demand this kind of credit because it's too expensive. So perhaps in the second period, it will be the case that we only have 25% good customers, which deserves a low interest rate, but we have 
percent bad customers which deserve the high interest rate. What if the bank wants more? Calculates the weighted average interest rate according to the new pool of customers. 25% good customers, 75% bad customers leads to an interest rate of 8.75%. So the bank will offer consumer credits at the interest rate of 8.75. And uh, the risk premium uh, for the good customers increases to the level of 3.75%. So even more good customers will leave the market. Where does this game end? In the end, it will be the case that all good customers disappear. The bank serves only bad customers and offers the interest rate of 10%. Check. Like now we know what we were talking about on slide number 11 that the good customers will disappear. But what would happen in the setting in case that the quality of customers is a continuum? A continuum between very good customers, which will pay back with the likelihood of 100%, and very, very bad customers who do not deserve a credit at all. So the very, very bad customers was they will not pay back with a likelihood of 100%. In this case, the market will break down. The adverse selection process will take uh, place. And in the end, it will be the case that the credit market breaks down completely. This is uh, mentioned by Akalov in his very famous paper on adverse selection. He argues that in case that in a market which is characterized by an asymmetric information relationship between the demand and the supply side, there will be some market mechanisms which lead to an inefficient market outcome. He assumes that quality is a private information of the supplier. Customers are only willing to pay the price for an average quality Goods which are high, with a high quality yield a price which is too low. Goods with a low quality yield a price that is too high. And goods with a high quality will be withdrawn from the market and disappear over time so that the average quality will decrease over time. And this mechanism is called adverse selection. What is Akalov talking about? Akalov is talking about the market for used cars. Maybe it is the case that very, very bad cars, they deserve a price of zero and good, car, good used cars, they deserve a price of 10,000. So in case that the demand cannot find out whether it's a good car or a bad car, then of course uh, the demand side has to compute like the weighted average price maybe it is the case that they the demand side calculates a price of 5000 but then all the cars which have a value between 5000 and 10000 they will disappear from the market like the good cars they will not be offered on the used car market anymore because the supply side the private customer who owns the car and wants to sell it they know whether they have a good or a bad car. They know whether the car is dependable or not, and whether the price of 5,000, like this average price, is too low. Then also, like the good cars, will disappear from the market. Another term which will play a role in this chapter is moral hazard. Moral hazard can be de defined as the change of the behavior after the contract is signed. It implies that some people do not stick to the contract. The action departs from the action agreed upon because of the fact that the action cannot be observed by the other party. For, it, for example, it might be the case that one private customer arrives at the bank, asks for a bank loan because 
um, the private household says that the car broke down, he needs a car to arrive uh, at work, and therefore the bank is willing to finance a car. But then when the money arrives on the account of the private person, it is the case that the private person does not stick the contract, the private person does not buy a car, but is using the money to make a holiday. After the holiday is over, of course, uh, the private person doesn't have uh, a car, so cannot arrive at the job, and hence the private customer is not able to repay the loan. So the private customer is not sticking to the contract, is not buying a car from the loan. This is a case uh, like moral hazard can occur in case that the high profit of an investment would only benefit the debitor, but the loss of the investment would be like a burden for the bank. Sometimes also a principal agent relationship plays a role where one actor, the agent, acts uh, substitutional for a client, the principal, and should act in the best interest of the client. In this case also moral hazard might occur in case that the preferences are different between the two parties. In case that the principal cannot observe whether the agent acts in the best in interest of the principal or whether the agent acts in his own interest. Why is a principal-agent relationship present in a banking system? It might be the case that the bank advertises that uh, the bank wants to collect some liquidity from private households which want to save. The bank promises to invest this liquidity in a secure alternative, but when the, uh, the bank has collected the liquidity, it is the case that the bank does not stick to the contract and uh, the bank, which is the agent, does not act in the best interest of the principal, the private household, but the bank, the agent, is uh, changing uh, its behavior, does not stick to the contract, changes the behavior and invest in the risky project. This principal-agent relationship and moral hazard will play a very prominent role in the Milgram Roberts model. Therefore, we'll go back to this kind of um, setting later on in this lecture. Moral hazard can also play a role uh, when it comes to the role of central banks. Sometimes central banks they have the so-called lender of the last resort function. What is that? Originally, this term, lender of the last resort, referred to a reserve financial institution that secured other banks or eligible institutions, for example, insurance company, as a last resort. Most often, the lender of the last resort function is the central bank of a country. The purpose of this loan and the lender of the last resort is to prevent the collapse of one bank which is experiencing financial difficulties. Most often this bank is near a collapse. If the central bank serves as an insurance for the banking sector, the banks will have an incentive to invest in riskier projects. Due to the special role in case of a financial stability problem, like first come, first serve, depositors, like the private households, may have an incentive to monitor the investment policy of the bank. But when the lender of the last resort exists, this will reduce the incentive for the private household to do the monitoring, and therefore it might be the case that when one country installs a lender of the last resort, installs this kind of insurance company for the banking sector, this leads to moral hazard. 
and the whole banking sector will invest in more risky projects. This will also be discussed in the Milgram Roberts model. But before uh, we come to the Milgram Roberts model, we'll talk about the Diamond Dipwick model in the next part of this lecture. Thank you very much for attending this first part where we talked about the introduction, we talked about the Hashtag Bank, we talked about principal agent relationships moral hazard and adverse selection. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Bye-bye.